We're back, and President Biden is siding with congressional Republicans in a rare reversal that has blindsided some Democrats. In an apparent effort to show that he is tough on crime, the president told Senate Democrats yesterday that he will no longer veto Republican attempts to reverse the new D.C. crime law. In a tweet, the president cited the D.C. mayor's objections to the law's lowered criminal penalties, but insists he still backs the district's push for statehood. Of course, that's a hot topic in the nation's capital. I pushed the White House press secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, on this issue and the broader impact yesterday. Why should Americans believe the White House when it says it doesn't support something if the president's going to sign it no less? What is different about this uh, signing it is, it, as I mentioned before, uh, the D.C. Council put forward was put forward over the mayor's objections, and the president wants to make sure that communities, even in D.C., the Americans in D.C., feel safe. The backstory there being that the administration had said that it, well, would not support it, and now the White House says that it will. Here with me is the NBC News Homeland Security correspondent, Julia Ainsley, Reuters White House correspondent, Jeff Mason. And fortunate for us, we still have former U.S. attorney, Joyce Vance. Julia, let me start with you, and, and let's start on this crime law itself here in Washington, D.C. This has been a major topic, but it's one that really has tentacles, I think, across the country as we discuss the issue of crime ahead of the next election in 2024 right now. This changes how D.C. Uh, punishes, prosecutes cases cases of crime, including, including carjackings. Walk us through that. Yeah, and it's a really unusual position for the president to be in, because when else would he be weighing in on the minutia of a crime bill at this local level? But of course, in D.C., he can't. What this would do, would it would basically eliminate most mandatory minimum sentences. It would also allow for jury trials in the cases of misdemeanors, and it would low, lower penalties for carjackings. Now, having a jury seems like a good idea, but in D.C., when you're talking about a backlog in courts, that could mean a lot of people simply being let go. Uh, they're not going to be held in, in detention, not going to be held in jail while they wait for those trials. So as you wait for a jury longer and longer, those people could be out committing more crimes. And it's something that the mayor here actually opposed and the city council passed it anyway. That's exactly right. The mayor saying that self-rule is more important, right? Our decision making is more important than this issue itself. So, Jeff, on this topic, the White House, as we tried to get to in that exchange with the press secretary yesterday, is really in a bit of a pickle here, right? Because they like to say, hey, we stand for the District of Columbia. We like them to be the 51st state. We like them to be able to rule themselves here. But on this issue, we've got to intervene because we believe they've got to be tougher on crime here. And it does raise a lot of challenging questions for them, especially after what we witnessed with Lori Lightfoot. She, of course, is the Chicago Democratic mayor who just lost her bid for reelection, even in the primary. Is the White House just trying to demonstrate it's tough on crime? What is the motivation? What changed here? Well, so I think Corrine said to you that the difference was that the mayor opposed this. I think the difference is President Biden can't look soft on crime. And that is a political reality. That's something that he faced in the 2022 midterm elections, although it didn't end up hurting Democrats as much as some Republicans thought it would. But it is certainly going to be an issue going into the presidential election. It's something that President Trump will bring up, former President Trump will bring up, and other Republican candidates will as well. And I think it's something that Biden genuinely opposed. He has been, a, both as a candidate and as president, somebody who opposes defund the police, despite some progressive push for that. That's not in line with Biden's views, and this wasn't either. Well, you can just see the way this would have played out as a campaign ad, right? President Biden in his own back Backyard, yes. in his own backyard, supported a weaker stance on crime. Joyce, I want to ask you about this. It's rare, but it's not unprecedented for Congress to engage in this way to basically block a law passed by the D.C. Council. But D.C.'s crime code has not been updated for more than a century, since 1901. Well, it hasn't been. And here we see one of the reasons why it's this unique situation in the District of Columbia you know, this begs the entire issue of criminal justice reform. And there is a lot of data that suggests that the pursuit of smart on crime policies actually reduces crime and makes communities safer. And there's some effort to track that sort of data in this new bill. But we also see the reason that criminal justice reform has remained in many ways an unattainable goal. It's because of political bumper stickers like, you know, you're yeah. not tough on crime and the fear politicians have that when they impose smart policy, they'll be rejected by voters in the next election. 
Julie, I want to ask you on another topic. The Justice Department is weighing in on uh, absolute immunity, saying that Mr. Trump, the former president, can be sued over January 6th attacks, effectively the things that he said ahead of the violence that we saw on that day. The brief that was filed yesterday is careful not to say if, if former President Trump is liable for damages here. The Trump team effectively says this, uh, th this is a frivolous lawsuit were it to happen. So is the DOJ just trying to draw a line here? What's, it, what's going on? Yes, they're telling the federal appeals court here in Washington that, you know what, the president, a former president or anyone in the future, cannot claim that it's political speech or that they're protected by their job if they are, in their words, using that speech to incite or em and to, to constitute incitement and to emanate private violence. I mean, that is what they are saying, that his speech on January 6th went beyond what would be protected under his job and so that he could be held liable in civil lawsuits. So this, Joyce, is about official comments versus sort of unofficial ones, some that are done as president, others that are done as a campaigner here. Help us understand how we should view this. Well, it's complicated, but I think the right way to look at what DOJ is doing here is they're saying Presidents have a very broad expanse of conduct that they can engage in that should be considered part of their official conduct. But this, what Julia is correctly characterizing as an incitement to private violence, that's beyond the scope of anything a president can reasonably do while he's in office. So the president has no immunity here by virtue of his federal employment status. And he can be sued just like any other American could be sued for the charges that are being brought by members of Congress and Capitol Police in this lawsuit. And Jeff, very quickly, just complicates the issue for Donald Trump one more time as he looks to 2024. It absolutely does. I mean, the politics of this is that that will keep coming up and it's something that Democrats can keep throwing at him as well.